Hi and welcome to the ONS Joint Symposium and thank you for joining us today. Uh, first, I want to apologize for any difficulties you or we might have had. Um, we are graduating to a more sophisticated platform in September. This webinar is designed to give you a good understanding of the entire process of undergoing a joint replacement, whether it be inpatient or outpatient at our ambulatory joint center in Stanford. My name is Tori Kroll. I'm the nurse case manager here at ONS. Prior to moving over to ONS two years ago, I was the joint and spine coordinator at Greenwich Hospital for many, many years, a long time. <laughs> and today I'm here to talk to you about the support services that ONS provides for our patients who are having in or outpatient total joint procedures. I will be followed by joint replacement surgeon, Dr. Jonathan Berliner, who is the director of our outpatient joint replacement surgery center. Dr. Berliner will tell you about the different approaches for a hip replacement procedure. Dr. Kevin Chu will then take you through knee replacement procedures, and he will be followed by Dr. Catherine Vadazdi, who will discuss shoulder replacement surgery. And then finally, Alicia Hirsch, Director of Physical Therapy at our Stanford office, will let you know what to expect during rehab and recovery for a joint replacement. There may be a 10 second pause between presenters. Each presentation will last approximately 15 to 20 minutes. And you can type any questions you may have at any time during the presentation. All questions will be answered at the end of the program. A recording of this webinar will be up on the webinars page of our website, which is onsmd.com. Because I've been doing this for such a long time, I can tell you that joint surgery, jo joint replacement surgery used to involve coming to the hospital days ahead of time, a prolonged hospital stay, usually followed by a long stay at a short term rehab facility um, then followed by home care at home and then a long course of outpatient physical therapy following that. Due to the skill of our exceptional surgeons, improved prostheses and less invasive surgical techniques, better anesthesia, better nerve blocks, better pain management and much earlier mobility postoperatively, that process has become much more efficient and streamlined for patients. In fact, most patients, if they go into the hospital, only stay for one or two nights and then go directly home from the hospital with home care, either physical therapy um, or physical therapy and nursing if it's required. Very few patients required skilled nursing care at a rehab facility as an inpatient postoperatively. In fact, some patients who uh, qualify and meet certain criteria are able to have joint replacement at our ambulatory surgery center in Stanford and return home that afternoon with home care services. So most patients with guided support and planning can recover in the comfort and safety of their own home. In either setting, whether it's at the hospital or the ambulatory surgery center, Patients need a reliable person at home to assist with their care upon discharge. I get lots of questions from both caregivers and patients regarding exactly what this entails. So to give you a broad idea, by the time a patient is discharged home, most patients are usually able to ambulate or walk with a walker at least 100 to 150 feet safely. They're able to transfer in and out of bed and in and out of a chair safely. And they're also able to go up and down a standard flight of stairs safely using a cane. Needless to say, the more we can prepare and educate you prior to surgery and provide you with the equipment that you need, send you for a physical therapy consult prior to surgery, identify your pre and post-op needs, and set up your post-op care, including outpatient physical therapy with frequent monitoring, the more smoothly this process runs. My role, as well as that of your surgeon, 
the nursing staff, physicians, assistants, surgical coordinators, and the staff at ONS is to help you navigate through the journey of joint replacement successfully from beginning to end. Through a series of preoperative medical and surgical clearances, lab tests, the hospital class, meeting with surgical coordinators and consulting with nurse case managers, we develop a plan of care that's specifically designed for you. That plan of care then follows you to the hospital or the surgery center and then home. A lot of patients like in getting ready for joint replacement to a full time job. <clears throat> there is a lot of planning and activity involved. However, having a safe and appropriate plan in place allows you to then just concentrate on having your joint replacement and participating in rehab and recovery. And that leads back to a life without limited mobility and pain. So now I'll introduce you to Dr. Jonathan Berliner. All right, um, welcome to everybody at home and thanks for the opportunity to speak with everybody. I'll be discussing um, total hip replacement, including um, you know, how we treat hip arthritis, um, when to decide surgery is the right treatment option for you, um, and different trends and, and advancements we've made recently over the last several years to accelerate the recovery process and make it easier for patients and allow, as Tori mentioned, the majority of patients to return home after this operation, which I think um, many do appreciate. So here's a little outline of uh, what I'll be discussing. Um, I'll just start briefly uh, talking about hip and then Kevin Chu after me will discuss knee arthritis. Um, we'll talk about all the treatment options available to patients, including both the non-surgical and surgical treatment options. I'll start to speak a little bit about rapid recovery um, and different techniques that we use uh, to accelerate the recovery process. And then um, lastly, I'll talk a bit about outpatient joint replacement surgery, um, where patients are able to return home the day of the operation and how we decide uh, which patients are good candidates for that. And um, if it does seem to be a good option for you, you know, what some of the potential benefits are. So starting from the very beginning here, talking about hip uh, arthritis, all arthritis really is, is uh, loss of the articular cartilage within the joint. So if you look at that picture at the top of your screen, that's actually the, the femoral head, which is the ball within the hip. As, as most of you know, the hip is a, a ball and a cup joint. And the surface of that ball is covered in a, in a healthy cartilage layer, which looks like a smooth white uh, surface. The, the picture at the bottom of the screen there is a femoral head that's lost the majority of its articular cartilage, which is what the process of arthritis is. And when that happens, not only does the joint lose the ability to have uh, smooth motion, but the bone underneath that cartilage has many nerves in it, and those nerves get quite irritated uh, after the cartilage has thinned out, causing the joint to become very stiff and sore and achy. Um, and that's a lot of the symptoms that many patients with arthritis experience. There are many different reasons you can get arthritis. By far and away, the most common is called osteoarthritis, which is what many people consider wear and tear or degenerative arthritis. Um, but there are multiple other reasons, such as having an inflammatory disorder, such as rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, if you've had prior trauma to the joint, that can uh, initiate the process of arthritis. And sometimes people even have congenital deformities or abnormalities that over time may contribute to thinning of this cartilage. But Really, regardless of the reason, <clears throat> once that cartilage thins, the end result is pain, limited range of motion, and decrease in function. So when a patient comes into the office, uh, we tend to discuss your history, you know, get a thorough understanding of how long you've been having pain, um, the symptoms of your pain. We'll do a physical exam to try to localize where the pain is originating from. And we almost always get imaging in the office, specifically x-rays. Um, X-rays are a very efficient uh, way to determine what degree of arthritis is in the joint. So this is an example of a hip X-ray. And if you look on the left side of the screen there, 
Uh, I don't know if you're able to see my pointer, but you know what we see is the outline of the ball and this white line coming around it is the cup. And we see a good amount of space in between the top of the ball and that white line. That area is filled with cartilage and is representative of the good amount of cartilage that's remaining in the joint. If you go to the image on the right side of the screen, what you see is a, is a severely arthritic hip where there's no longer that space uh, where the cartilage used to exist. And in addition, there's bone spurs around the periphery of the joint and uh, what we call sclerosis or hardening of the bone. And these are all consequences of that cartilage thinning. So I think for patients who are dealing with the symptoms of arthritis, um, it's very helpful to understand just how common uh, this process is. So there are predictions that within 10 years, by the year 2030, the percentage of the US population, um, who we consider to be the baby boomers, over 65 will go from about 13 to 20% of people in the United States. And it's projected that out of this group, over 40% will have some form of arthritis. And so this is an extremely common problem. Um, and many patients, uh, especially individuals getting into their 60s and 70s, are dealing with some form of, of pain uh, secondary to arthritis. There is a bit of a geographic distribution, as you see on the map here. Um, and this is most likely explained by the rates of obesity in our country. There's no question that as obesity rates go up, um, there's a direct correlation with the development of, of degenerative changes within the joint. So because of this, um, there have been studies looking at the projections of demand for hip and knee replacement. And uh, some of these numbers are a bit staggering where uh, the projection for total knee replacement over this 25 year period goes up by almost 700% and hip replacement almost 200%. So transitioning into the treatments for arthritis, um, generally we break it down into the two broad categories of both non-surgical and surgical treatment. I think both of these treatments are predicated on the fact that unfortunately we still don't have the technology to put cartilage back into the joint. Um, it would be nice, of course, if we did, but because we're not able to put the cartilage back into the joint, the treatments are really designed to either reduce the inflammation in the joint and strengthen the muscles around the joint with the hopes that the pain levels come down and the function improves, or just really kind of replace that worn out arthritic surface of the joint altogether, which is the surgery. Now, in terms of the non-surgical treatments, arthritis is so common that the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery has a very specific list of recommended treatments. The non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs are kind of the mainstay of treatment. Um, and this is a very commonly used method that tends to actually work quite well. There are over-the-counter medications such as Advil and Aleve, and there are also prescription forms. We tend to counsel patients to modify their activities a bit. And generally what that means is limiting the amount, the, the amount of high impact activities that you're doing, such as running, jogging, and jumping. I think for patients with arthritic joints, the lower impact activities tend to be more favorable and less irritating to the joint. So this would include um, swimming or cycling or even elliptical. Um, physical therapy for many patients can be effective to strengthen the muscles around the joint, kind of give the knee a little bit or the hip a little bit more support. Um, and sometimes they are able to improve range of motion as well. Injections um, for many patients can be helpful. Um, really the only one currently recommended by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery is cortisone, which is a strong anti-inflammatory medication. There are other types that patients will, will often try, including what's called visco supplementation, which is hyaluronic acid, which is injected into the joint. And there are newer forms of injections, such as PRP and stem cells. Um, I won't get into the detail of these, but these tend to be a little bit um, more experimental in terms of their use. Weight loss uh, in many studies has been shown to be very effective at not only reducing pain, but even um, slowing the progression of arthritis within the joint. And for patients where the pain really tends to get quite severe and they're having trouble, you know, even doing simple daily activities, sometimes a cane or a walker can be helpful to take some of the weight off of the joint. Um, surgical treatment, which I'll get into a bit uh, in more detail in a minute, in, involves total hip replacement. Um, there is another uh, surgical treatment, which is very rarely used, which is called hip resurfacing, which I won't get into details about. But if you look at the prevalence of hip replacement versus resurfacing. Hip resurfacing accounts for actually less than 1% of surgery done for, for hip arthritis in this country. So it's, it's not a very common procedure. So when we talk a little bit more about hip replacement, 
I think a lot of patients when they come into the office are, are curious as to whether they're a candidate and if they are, when's the right time to do this operation. So the decision to, to move forward with a total hip replacement is really based on a patient's history, their exam and imaging, which are all consistent with the fact that they have what we like to see as severe or bone on bone arthritis within the joint. Um, most patients have tried and failed conservative treatment, meaning they've tried anti-inflammatories, they've tried therapy, sometimes they've tried an injection, and their pain really continues to progress to the point where they're having difficulty doing the activities that they want to do or even some simple daily activities. And because of that, their quality of life has really been reduced and they feel like the joint is starting to run their life. But at the end of the day, these operations are truly an elective procedure, meaning <clears throat> it's very rare to have an emergency or an urgency to these operations. So most often the timing of these procedures is a personal decision. And a lot of patients take into consideration their family, their job, and having you know a, a month or two after the operation to really focus on the recovery. So for the end of the talk, I'll talk a little bit more about um, techniques we use to speed the recovery, as well as uh, patients transitioning into the outpatient, um, go home the same day of surgery. So this is really a process that starts before the surgery and involves techniques before, during, and after the operation. So importantly, before the surgery, we try to counsel patients as much as we can to get make them as educated as they can about returning home so that there's, I think, a little bit less fear of the unknown. For a lot of patients in terms of returning home the same day or after the hospital, I think one of the highest barriers to doing that is that they're concerned about what they don't know and possibly that their pain won't be controlled or they're going to have problems getting, you know, getting around the house. And I think by educating patients, a lot of these concerns are appeased and patients build the confidence that they can go home successfully. So <clears throat> the preoperative education involves a case manager such as Tori. And I think for patients that elect to have surgery at ONS, um, many of you will work with Tori. And I think she's a uh, you know, invaluable part of this process, getting patients comfortable and, and confident about going home. Um, the, your physician will also work with, you know, you to, to discuss the post-operative plan and go into real detail about what to expect in terms of your medications, your physical therapy. And we also provide patients with a, a preoperative manual that's very thorough and covers really all the facets of what to expect um, after the operation. We also advise many patients to do what we call prehab or preoperative physical therapy. And this usually involves a visit to the ONS physical therapy office where the therapist will work with you to review what to expect when you get home in terms of the physical therapy that you'll be doing. They'll teach you how to use a cane or a walker and navigate some of the obstacles in your home, such as stairs. And they'll also teach you how to do some of those essential daily activities, such as getting in and out of the bathroom, getting in and out of bed, going up and down stairs. That way, when you go home, you really don't have many question marks and you know that you'll be able to do all the, these basic activities. During the surgery, we employ a couple techniques to try to speed up recovery. Um, when we talk about hip replacement, when I do this surgery, I use mostly what we call the anterior approach, which is really the only approach that's a true intermuscular approach, meaning we're not violating any of the muscles or tendons during the operation. I think there are a couple potential benefits of this. Really, when a patient elects to have a total hip replacement, I think that's the most important decision. Probably the approach that is used during the surgery is a lesser decision because regardless of the approach that's used, patients fortunately tend to do very well after hip replacement. And um, you know, six months or a year after the surgery, it, it really probably doesn't matter so much which approach you've had. But when we talk about the anterior approach, there have been numerous studies now showing that patients may have a quicker recovery and sometimes require less pain medications after the operation. And I think one nice thing for the patients is that there's no restrictions in terms of movement, meaning after the operation, you're able to move the leg however you like, sit in whatever chairs you like, sleep however you want. And when the other approaches are used, sometimes the surgeon may limit um, the movement of the leg for the first month or two. I think because of that, if you look at surveys of, of hip replacement surgeons, um, the percentage of them that are using the anterior approach seems to be increasing steadily. And I apologize, I don't have more recent data, but you can see that you know, over the last 10 years that this approach has become more and more common. Um, whereas in 2016, the percentage of surgeons doing some of their hip replacements to the anterior approach was about 
probably the most important thing, honestly, that we've changed over the last couple of years to facilitate rapid recovery is our anesthetic techniques. This includes the medications you're taking. We try to limit the amount of narcotic pain medications that you're using and instead use numerous medications at lower doses. Regional anesthesia can often do a nerve block to really almost you know, eliminate or, or very much minimize your pain after the surgery for the first 12 to 24 hours. Um, we tend to use spinal anesthesia, which also helps with pain control. Um, and we also do what's called an intraoperative periarticular injection which is an injection around the joint of an anesthetic that can be long lasting, sometimes up to three days. And I think it's really a combination of all these different techniques that help minimize patients' pain and allow them to get up and start moving very quickly after the operation. The wounds are typically closed with a glue and they're covered with a uh, waterproof dressing, which means that when you go home, you can shower. And so it's really minimized the restrictions patients have after the operation. It allows them to really get back to their normal daily routine with, with minimal limitations. So lastly, just to talk about outpatient joint replacement surgery, meaning that you go home the same day of the surgery. A lot of patients you know, ask why you know, they may want to do that when for the last 20 to 30 years, patients have been staying in the hospital for anywhere from you know, one to three days after the operation. And I think Going home the same day of surgery is really a natural progression of these rapid recovery protocols where patients are very capable and, and they're safe to go home the same day of the surgery. There's certainly benefits to the patient of being home. You know, just to run through a quick list here, you get to sleep in your own bed. You don't have to ask a nurse for your medications. You don't have your blood drawn in the morning. You don't have to ask to get up. You can move freely um, and get out of your bed when you like. Um, some studies have shown a reduction in the risk of infection, a small reduction in the risk of infection when you go home. And these days in the setting of coronavirus, a lot of patients like the idea of not having to spend a night in the hospital. So when we decide you know, who to do uh, outpatient surgery for, I think the most important thing is that the patient's motivated. You know, These are patients that like the idea of returning home um, and they want to do so. I think it's important to know that currently Medicare doesn't provide for outpatient surgery at a surgery center. Um, we are able to do outpatient surgery in the setting of the hospital, so you can still have the surgery at the hospital and go home the same day. Patients tend to be relatively healthy, meaning you don't have a significant medical issue that we'd want to monitor for the first day or two after surgery. And they tend to be relatively fit, you know, meaning they're not in the morbidly obese category. And I think also very importantly is that patients have a caregiver, meaning they have somebody to drop them off at the surgery, pick them up, and when you go home, help them with some of their their basic needs, such as preparing food or, or getting some of their belongings in the, in the morning, such as getting dressed. And I think having somebody to keep an eye on you for the first couple of days is, is also very important. We do set up comprehensive care for you at home. So, you know, we would check in on you the first couple of days after surgery. We make sure that your pain is controlled. We actually set up a physical therapist to come to your house. So you're doing therapy at home. We often have a nurse come to check in on you at least once the first week. And oftentimes we're able to set up physical therapy comprehensively where you're having it even every day that first week and a couple of visits uh, the second week. There have been numerous studies looking at the rate of adverse events after outpatient surgery and really none of them have shown increased risk or rates of adverse events after surgery if you go home. And there have been a couple of patient satisfaction studies and what the majority of these show is that patients when they're able to go home the same day of surgery actually prefer it and that the patient reported outcomes or questionnaires, the results are quite similar, but when there's any variation, it tends to favor the outpatient surgery. So I think just to wrap that up, you know, the take home points is that overall total hip replacement is a very successful operation, regardless of how it's done or where it's done. It's important to talk to your surgeon though about what approach and post-operative recovery plan may be best for you. But for those who do elect to go home the same day of surgery, it's a very safe alternative uh, for healthy and motivated patients. And for those that do it, uh, what we've seen is across the board, patients really enjoy that experience. So that, that wraps things up. I think we're gonna save questions till the end. Um, I'll introduce Kevin Chu next. He's also one of our hip and knee replacement specialists, and he's gonna be talking to me about um, knee replacement uh, surgery. All right, well, thank you. Dr. Berliner for that great introduction and description of total hip arthroplasty. Uh, we'll now continue on to a topic that's related, uh, which is total knee replacement. 
So as a quick introduction here, we'll go through our agenda. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit of a background of total knee replacements and how they work. Uh, similarly, we'll also discuss when it's time to consider doing surgery for this topic. And then we'll also talk about sort of the new topics and ideas in knee replacement surgery. And as uh, Tori mentioned earlier, uh, there will be a recording online. And uh, you can also send suggestions for future topics to our website and email. So first, we'll begin with uh, describing what a total knee replacement is and how it works. So the first reference to knee replacement surgery actually was quite a long time ago. This was actually over 100 years ago in Germany. And if you look at the top half at the, of the screen, the knee replacement was sort of a rudimentary device. Essentially, at the time, what they would do is actually remove the whole knee joint and replace it with what was essentially a, uh, a bearing, a simple uh, ball bearing uh, spoken wheel configuration there. And that was actually held in place with plaster repairs. So clearly a very rudimentary design. These really changed uh, going into the 1950s and 1970s, where there really was significant innovation in this field. We had more modern materials, including the use of modern metal alloys, as well as polyethylene, which is plastic. And one of the main differences was that instead of cutting above and below the knee and replacing the whole knee, we began to do a surgery that really sought to conserve the bone and resurface the knee rather than replace the whole knee joint. So as I zoom in here, you can see that uh, at the image to the left and the right, that's a oblique and a lateral oblique view of a old style knee replacement. If you look, it sought to sort of recreate the dimensions of a knee, but really replacing the thin layer of cartilage and bone near the surface of the joint. In 1970 uh, was the advent of what I would consider to be modern knee replacements. And since then, there have been some slight improvements to the design and geometry of these implants. The plastic is significantly improved in its durability and wear characteristics, and we have much more sizes and laterality so that we can really match a patient's native anatomy. So this brings us to 2020. So this uh, to the top right is a picture of a modern total knee replacement. So if you look at the configuration of how the knee replacement looks, there are really two different areas. There are end caps. So you can imagine that there's an end cap on the bottom of the femur bone which is in the thigh, and an end cap at the top of the tibia bone, which is in the shin. And these are made out of titanium alloy or cobalt chromium. In between is what I sometimes call the cushion, which is polyethylene or a high density plastic. And sometimes we refer to this as being the new cartilage in the knee. Essentially, this is the new wear surface in the knee and provides cushioning inside. And so the remarkable thing about knee replacement, similar to shoulder and hip replacement, is that these are essentially curative procedures for arthritis. And what we know now is that we have good results, faster recovery, and excellent longevity of the implants over time. So at the two images here, we have some images uh, demonstrating uh, normal and diseased cartilage. So you can see at the bottom left, normal knee joint, uh, and at the top right, a picture of normal cartilage. And at the bottom, middle, and right, you can see diseased cartilage and that's really what osteoarthritis looks like. So normal cartilage is pretty special material. It's a low friction, and it is also very effective at low transmission. And when you have a disease of the cartilage for any reason, you can have numerous problems. So loss of the normal function of the cartilage can lead to decreased lubrication of the joint, leading to increased friction. When the cartilage gets thinned, that can lead to increased force transmitted to the bone, and that can cause pain. Secondary to that, the bone can undergo some changes, including hardening, Sometimes we call that sclerosis. You can get secondary reactive inflammatory changes such as cysts underneath the bone or bone spurs, which are commonly a cause of limited range of motion and stiffness. And so one important thing to remember is that this is really a combined problem of the cartilage and the underlying bone. It's not merely that the cartilage is worn out, it's that the bone underneath has also undergone microscopic and macroscopic changes as well. And patients generally perceive this as pain and swelling inside the knee joint. Some other common symptoms, limited walking ability or the need for a cane or a walker, pain with stairs, crepitus, which is the sensation of the joints cracking and popping, stiffness, fatigue, and in more severe cases would be malalignment. Sometimes we call this deformity, which would be if the knees become bow-legged or knock knee in alignment. So now that we understand what the problem is, it sort of becomes a little bit more clear why the knee replacement surgery works. So, Again, it is a very effective treatment for knee arthritis, 
And it, again, it is essentially a resurfacing procedure. So we remove the diseased cartilage remnant and a thin layer of the underlying bone, usually between two to 10 millimeters of bone. So it's generally very bone conserving. A very common question I get in the office is whether or not we make a cut above the knee and below the knee and remove the whole thing. So it really is not like that. And you can see from here how it actually demonstrates the results. So if you look at the x-ray to the left is the before demonstrating a severely arthritic knee and to the right, the after picture. If you look at the far right of both of those images, you can see how it's really just replacing the end caps. And that empty space in between, I'll show you on my cursor, this is the end cap on the femur bone, the end cap on the tibia bone, and then between that empty space is not actually empty, that's where that plastic cushion is. So next we'll talk about when it's time to consider the knee replacement surgery. So again, we want patients to have evidence of having arthritis on the x-ray. Uh, patients should have clinical symptoms, which I mentioned before, and we generally desire patients to try some conservative treatment, uh, which were described previously. Uh, briefly, they include activity modification, uh, medications, bracing, physical therapy, and possibly injections as well. One thing I say often in the uh, office is that it is far more important how you are doing as a person and as a patient uh, than how the x-rays look. So if we consider a case to the left, we have a patient with x-ray evidence of severe arthritis. This can be in one of two directions. So at the top, I would say this would be a patient who may consider waiting. So someone who has only mild or moderate pain can still do all of their desired activities. They really consider the, the fatigue or the discomfort to be more of a minor inconvenience and perhaps they have not tried other treatments yet. Conversely, we also see patients who have the arthritis on the x-ray, but also have more severe symptoms. They have limitations for, for their activities. That could be anything from recreation, walking, traveling, anything really that contributes to a positive quality of life. Uh, pain disturbing sleep is a very common presenting symptom and that for many patients is the trigger to really consider surgery. And in general, these patients would have tried other treatments as well. So last, I'll briefly talk about some of the newer topics in knee replacement surgery. Uh, you'll find that most of these slides have a fair amount of text, so I do encourage you to take a look at the talk again and pull it up and look it over at your own time on your own. And obviously, I do encourage you to always talk with your surgeon to see if any of these approaches would be appropriate for you. So again, you know, the, the real uh, ad advance in knee replacement hip and shoulder replacement surgery, I would say over the past 10 to 15 years has been our rapid recovery protocol, which is really essentially a multimodal pain regimen. So we often do a spinal anesthetic. Patients receive nerve blocks, which are regional blocks that are done under an ultrasound guidance, and then also localized injections into the wound during surgery. One thing to note is that after surgery, patients receive numerous medications, and these medications do work together. We say that they work synergistically to provide really good pain relief while using relatively low doses of each uh, medication individually. Uh, that includes Tylenol, an anti-inflammatory, and then potentially nerve medications, muscle relaxants, and also opiate medications, which as you can imagine, we tend to avoid if at all possible. And now I, I tell most patients that with the other medications short of the narcotics, we typically can treat 75 to 85% of pain, and then the opiates are only needed if the pain gets more severe than that. One recent topic that's a uh, fairly uh, common discussion now is uh, regarding partial knee replacement. So you saw some of the earlier slides regarding a total knee replacement, uh, and that typically is indicated for patients that have arthritis that is diffusely spread throughout the knee joint. Some patients, however, have arthritis that is really localized to only a certain aspect of the knee. So if you look to the picture to the bottom left, you can see uh, an, a knee image as well as an x-ray. And you can see that the arthritis is really only in one half of the knee joint there and only one half of the knee joint there. And so you can imagine rather than doing a whole knee replacement, we can do a partial knee replacement. We also call this a unique compartmental replacement just to replace the area that's painful. And here you can see the partial joint versus the total knee replacement. So there are a few advantages to the partial knee replacement surgery. A couple are that many patients report that the knee feels slightly more natural compared to a total knee. Patients may have better function and they typically do have decreased pain after surgery and a faster recovery. Uh, many of these patients can very easily have these surgeries done at the outpatient surgery center or on an ambulatory basis at the hospital. Uh, the potential disadvantage is that these surgeries do have a slightly higher risk of requiring 
revision surgery, which is a conversion to a total knee replacement. And the reason why is that, as you can imagine, if you leave parts of the knee untouched during surgery, at some point in the future, they could, they could become arthritic as well, which is why if you look at the recent studies, the longevity or survivorship of partial knee replacements isn't quite as good as total knee replacements. So at the bottom of the screen there, I demonstrated a recent study, a meta-analysis, which is a very large study, which compared total knee and partial knee. And as you can see, both of them do very well, but if you compare total knee versus partial knee, the total knee replacements have a slightly better survivorship at 15 years and 20 years. And so it's very important to discuss with your surgeon to see if this surgery would be appropriate for you. The next topic is actually very related to this, and this is selective surgery to the patella. So selective patella resurfacing under the same rationale to replace the affected areas of the knee. So for most people, this is between the major joint in the knee, which is between the femur bone in the thigh and the tibia in the shin. The third joint in the knee is behind the backside of the patella. And currently the convention is to resurface this for all patients, regardless to the severity of arthritis in that joint. Uh, so you can see the two examples of a resurfaced patella or a sometimes called that a replaced patella versus a non-replaced patella to the bottom right hand of the screen. The studies actually show that not resurfacing or selectively resurfacing gives equivalent outcome and pain relief compared to replacing the whole knee. And so as you can imagine, when you consider doing this versus replacing the whole knee, it is slightly shorter, shorter surgery and less postoperative pain. And you also can avoid the complications of patella failure in the future, which is rare, but is a problem for some patients. The main disadvantage is if you have continued anterior knee pain from pain of an arthritic patella. So in general, the advice is to only consider selective patella resurfacing if you really have no symptoms or radiographic evidence of arthritis behind the patella. And again, this is very important to talk with your surgeon to see if you would be a good candidate for this. The last, uh, the next topic is computer assisted surgery. So this actually involves a very large field of computer assisted uh, devices and techniques. So I lumped them all together there. So that includes the use of robotic technology, the use of navigation and the use of patient specific implants. So one thing that's very important to know is that uh, robotic surgery really isn't robotic in an autonomous sense. Robotic assisted surgery is really a better way to describe it. And these are generally tools that help surgeons improve the reliability and accuracy of their surgery. They are not doing the surgery on behalf of the surgeon at all. And so you can see to the right there is a surgeon who's using a navigated system with a special device there, which is a motorized burr, which utilizes preoperative MRI as well as intraoperative uh, sensors to let the surgeon make more specific and precise preparation of the bone. And as you can imagine, the potential advantage is to improve the, the precision and reliability of the surgery. And what the data shows us is that it can help reduce outliers, which are rare, but these are positioned components that are grossly out of the right alignment or the wrong size. Um, these are rare all overall, but uh, use of this technology can sometimes reduce the risk of, of those uh, uh, exceptional cases. The major disadvantage of this is longer operative time the cost, and often the need for preoperative imaging, including CT or MRI scans. Uh, one thing that's important to note is that this actually doesn't affect your postoperative recovery. The surgery overall is actually the same, and the implants overall are exactly the same. It's mainly a tool for the surgeon to feel confident and reliable that they did a very good job in terms of aligning your components in a good position. Uh, the last is one that I actually think could be a potentially significant change and that is uh, the use of a cementless total knee replacement. So the convention right now for a knee replacement surgery, as I mentioned before, you have metal end caps to the femur and the tibia. The convention currently is to use bone cement, which is essentially a grout to stick the implants to the bone. Um, a relatively newer technology is called cementless, and this is actually based on good data that we have from total hip replacements, which is where the back surface of the implant actually has a microscopic porous coating which allows the bone to grow into or onto the metal, and we call that osseointegration. This actually has an excellent track record in both hip replacement implants as well as in dental implants. Uh, one of the major advantages of the surgery, one, it makes a sh uh, the shorter uh, surgery for the patient. And then the second, and I put a question mark here, is that it has the possibility to have a longer lasting implant. So whereas the grout doesn't have a biologic 
bond to the bone, if you have a cementless implant, in theory, the bone actually grows into and onto the metal, which could theoretically provide a more durable uh, bond and thereby decrease the risk of having future failure of the implant. Uh, the major disadvantages is that this is much newer technology, and so some of the durability studies is somewhat theoretical, and they are at risk of having issues if, for whatever reason, the bone does not grow into or onto the uh, metal substrate. So again, this is another thing to talk about with your surgeon. So in conclusion, uh, knee replacement surgery can be a highly effective surgery for the treatment of severe knee osteoarthritis and inflammatory conditions of the knee. Um, this is a quality of life decision. So we really encourage patients to ask themselves if they have any true limitations, if the pain is severe in any way, if they have tried other conservative treatments beforehand, and also if the surgery fits in with the life plan. Uh, in my opinion, it's really the pain relief protocols that have been the most significant change to knee surgery and uh, joint replacement surgery overall over the past 10 to 15 years. There are several new techniques and technologies. There's no clear right or wrong approach, so I generally encourage people to talk with their doctor to see if any of that makes sense for them. So uh, I wanted to thank you for your attention. Um, again, please uh, feel free to go online to check out our uh, talks from today at onsmd.com. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Catherine Vadazdi, one of our shoulder replacement surgery specialists, and she'll give an uh, overview and uh, updates regarding shoulder replacement surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Uh, my name is Katie Vadasi, and I'm going to speak about a uh, different joint this evening, the shoulder joint. Um, we've heard a lot about the total hips and about arthritis in the hip and knee, and we're going to learn a little bit about the shoulder joint, which has similarities, but a lot of differences in both of those joints. So I'm gonna to start to go um, just by talking about the anatomy of the shoulder. The anatomy of the shoulder is more similar to the hip and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, I'm also gonna discuss a little bit about shoulder arthritis itself and what that means for that joint. Um, how we evaluate the arthritis. Dr. Chu discussed how we look at it both as someone's symptoms and uh, the x-ray as well and we do that in the shoulder. The types of replacement that we may do based on the problems in the shoulder um, results and then post-operative pain which is also been touched upon tonight. So when we look at the shoulder joint, there's a ball and a socket. And those are the two main components that we're looking at when we're talking about arthritis in the shoulder joint. But there are also tendons around the shoulder. And the main tendons that we're concerned about in a total shoulder replacement are the tendons of the rotator cuff. And there are four of those tendons. There's one that comes right across the front. There's one that comes over the side. And then there are two in the back that are not seen well on this image, but are seen better on this picture here. So again, we see this picture right here is the tendon in the front called the subscapularis supraspinatus on the top going over to the side and then the two in the back and the reason these are so important is these tendons are necessary to do a total shoulder replacement if they're not functioning we cannot do a standard total shoulder replacement so my evaluation of a patient when they come in includes not only looking at the joint and the cartilage but also looking at those tendons there are two main types of uh, arthritis that we look at one is called osteoarthritis, and that's similar to what we've talked about in the hip and knee, and that's where we see wear or breakdown of the cartilage in the joint. Cartilage lines the bones in a joint, and as that wears down over time, there's less cushioning in between the two bones, and the bones start to rub against each other eventually. The other type of um, arthritis that we see is something called rotator cuff arthropathy. And that's very different than other joints at the hip or knee. And that in the shoulder, if those tendons of the rotator cuff are not functioning, we start to see a different type of arthritis. And that's where the ball starts to ride high and no longer has congruency with the socket. And I'm gonna show you pictures to begin with of osteoarthritis. This is where we're seeing wear of the cartilage itself. And starting on the left, we can see the four stages where you can have a normal shoulder and you can see the white here is glistening cartilage and that's normal healthy cartilage. As that cartilage wears down over time, 
you start to see area, small areas of wear. And eventually, looking all the way to the right, you'll see that all of that, or the majority of that cartilage is lost. And then looking at the picture of the joint here, you're seeing bone on bone, where the ball and the socket, the bone of those two areas is rubbing against each other. And that's, that's where the pain and limited function comes into play. Rotator cuff arthropathy is very different. So rather than just having loss of cartilage between the two, the tendons are not functioning and we see that the ball starts to go up. And so you start to actually create a second socket up high. And the reason this is so important is we cannot do a total shoulder replacement where we replace the ball with a ball and the socket with a socket in this situation. The mechanics of the shoulder will not allow for that. So that um, determines what we can do. So the symptoms of arthritis, osteoarthritis, the cartilage wear versus rotator cuff, cuff arthropathy can be very different. A patient with osteoarthritis will come in with pain, limited motion, and they'll often have um, what we call grinding or clicking in the shoulder. They hear noises popping and it's very painful. Rotator cuff arthropathy patients will also have pain, but they will have the added limitation where they have a lot of weakness. They can't raise their arm. They may not feel the popping or clicking, but they have weakness because the tendons in that shoulder are not functioning. So when we're looking at the physical exam, when someone comes in to see me for evaluation of their shoulder, the first thing I'm going to do is ask about their symptoms. Does it involve pain, clicking? Do they have loss of strength or function? But then I'm also going to do a physical exam, and that will show me different things in the case of arthritis versus when the rotator cuff is worn and that arthropathy. So in a rotator cuff, in a patient with arthritis, excuse me, you'll see loss of motion. We'll see crepitus, where as I move their shoulder around, you can really feel a grinding sensation as those bones are rubbing against each other. They have pain with motion and tenderness along the joint lines in the front of the shoulder. With the rotator cuff arthropathy, it's quite different. So they'll have significant weakness. They'll be unable to raise their arm. They'll have limited motion. Most of those patients will have pain, but it's not usually as severe as it is in osteoarthritis. So here's an x-ray looking at a shoulder joint, and there are a lot of different parts of the shoulder, which is why it's such a complex uh, joint, but we're going to really focus on the ball and the socket. The ball is right here called the humeral head, and the socket is right here. And I'm just going to go back. The space between these two white lines, that's where the cartilage sits. So in a normal healthy shoulder, that space represents cartilage. It's not uh, just space between the bones. So as that cartilage wears down, we start to see that that space narrows. So in the top picture, you can see that the space between these two bones is very limited. And at the bottom, the bones are actually touching. We also see bone spurs that develop as a result. That's a very different x-ray than at the top. And this is on the bottom, rotator cuff arthropathy, where you see that that ball is starting to rise high. And that's creating a, an abnormal function of that shoulder. So the treatment options are similar to arthritis in other parts of the body where we can start more conservatively if a patient comes in with limited pain um, or they're just starting to notice uh, limitations in their function. And we can start with anti-inflammatories. We can start with rest. I will often discuss with patients what their activity levels are and if there are certain things that we can modify so that we can eliminate some of their pain. We can work with steroid injections. Um, and then the final treatment is surgery. And we try to go through these options based on patient's imaging, but more importantly, based on their symptoms. There are two types of surgery that we can do for arthritis. We can do arthroscopy, which is a minimally invasive surgery. And this has a limited role in a patient who has stiffness, but perhaps is not ready for a total shoulder replacement for different reasons. And that can provide more motion and can be pain relieving. But that normally does not last very long for a lot of patients. The second type of surgery is, is a replacement surgery, and that's either a total shoulder replacement in the case of osteoarthritis, or something called a reverse total shoulder replacement when we see the cuff tear arthropathy. And so it's very important as a surgeon to understand which we're dealing with so we can do the appropriate surgery. These are the two different types of shoulder replacements. In this, on the top image, you'll see that the ball is replaced with the ball and the socket is replaced with a socket. That's reversed or flipped on the bottom image in the reverse total shoulder replacement, where we replace the ball with the socket and the socket with a ball. And what that does is alter the mechanics so that we can still, uh, that patient can still use their shoulder, really relying on the deltoid muscle in particular, in the um, because they don't have the rotator cuff tendons. 
So again, here's a, another image on the left hand side. We see the total shoulder replacement where the ball is still attached to that humerus bone and the socket is still attached to the what was the glenoid. This is the reverse on the on the right, which shows that the ball is now attached to the socket and the socket is attached to the humerus. These are going through some of the steps that we'll do during surgery to do a total shoulder replacement. So similar to a hip replacement, we will remove the arthritic head and then we will prepare the stem, which is this part right here called the humerus. We will put the implant in for the stem, put in a new socket and then put on a new head. At the end, you have a new ball and a new socket, which provides excellent motion and good pain relief for patients. So here's an x-ray image looking at that. On the left, you can see osteoarthritis where there's significant loss of space between the two bones. And on the right, we see the total shoulder replacement with the ball. And then on the left, the reason we don't see the socket is that is a plastic material. And so you don't see it on x-ray, but we do put a little metal bar in so that we know where it is and we can base our assessment of that location on that metal piece there. So here's a patient with a total shoulder replacement, and you can see postoperatively the excellent range of motion that he has on the right shoulder. Switching over to the reverse total shoulder, the reason this works is we're altering the center of rotation and we're lowering the humerus bone here, which allows your deltoid to take over function of the shoulder. The reverse total shoulder replacement, you can see you have the ball here, which has gone high. And instead of replacing the ball with a ball and the socket with a socket, we're going to replace the ball with the socket and the ball uh, over here will be replaced here. We don't see that socket again on this image because it is a plastic material. Here's a patient with a reverse total shoulder replacement. This is the image of the reverse on the left and on the right is the patient's function. And you can see they've regained excellent function. Here's another patient who had um, rotator cuff repair that failed. That means their rotator cuff wasn't functioning. So this is a patient who cannot have a total shoulder replacement, but instead had a reverse total shoulder replacement. And you can see their excellent function um, with this device, with this implant. Here's another patient who had a total shoulder replacement on one side and a reverse total shoulder replacement on the other side. Question is which side, the right and left give it away, but you can see that the function is very similar, but this individual had different problems on either shoulder and thus required different surgeries. So I, Dr. Chu and Dr. Berliner, Berliner mentioned earlier that one of the biggest improvements that we've seen in total joint replacement is our pain management. And it's one of the biggest advancements that we've seen uh, working with our anesthesia, anesthesia team and really improving the pain that patients have the control during surgery itself, but really afterward. And we are, for most of our total shoulder replacements, are able to send our patients home the same day or the day after because their pain is significantly better controlled than it had been in the past. And we work very closely with our anesthesia team to provide this. And that can include um, many different things. But one important thing that I spend a lot of time with is expectations with uh, my patients. And the expectation is that there will be some pain and we will manage it, but we can't eliminate it completely. And I think for a lot of patients, knowing that pain is normal and doesn't mean that there's anything wrong is very comforting for them. And having the discussion ahead of time is important. The second thing that we do is more minimally invasive surgery. So you can, and some of the implants that we're using, they're much smaller. We can do smaller incisions and it's much less invasive for the patient and then they have less pain afterward. And then the final is working with our anesthesia team and also understanding as physicians, as surgeons, how we use uh, medications and how we recommend our, our patients use them and how they um, get rid of them if they're not using them. And that's an important conversation to have. When we look at the different um, pain medications that we use, we call it a multimodal pain management program. And we're using different oral medications, IV medications, and nerve catheters that block the pain receptors in a combined fashion. And this really helps reduce pain. And I, um, we also use blocks, a local anesthetic that is a slow release 
that provides significant pain, uh, pain relief for patients over a period of time, usually around the first 48 hours after surgery, which is the most painful time. And because of this, a lot of our patients are not requiring any opioid pain medications after total shoulder replacement, which is a huge advance um, for our patients and really for um, the um, opioid crisis in, in our nation and with, uh, our, within our communities. So hopefully this video will play. I have a couple questions about your shoulder or, or both of your shoulders. So what procedure did you have done for your shoulders? I had a total shoulder replacement. Okay, on both sides? Both sides. Okay, and tell me for each one, how long did you stay in the hospital? Two nights the first time, but I really could have been out in one and one night the second time. Okay, and how much pain did you have after surgery? You know, for the first couple of days with the nerve block, I didn't have any. Okay. And then the pain was very manageable. I didn't take any pain medication. Okay, so you took no pain pills at all no. for these surgeries? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And how are you doing today? Excellent. My arm feels great. How about the other one? Excellent. Not doing any pull-ups, are you? Actually, I do the assisted pull-ups okay. with the weight machine. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this patient had both of his shoulders replaced and he, for both of them, did not use any narcotics. And that really is a huge advance for us. And he didn't do that because he was in a lot of pain. He did that because we provided alternative pain medications for him that allowed him to go through the procedure and the recovery without any pain. So I will finish up there and I'm going to introduce Alicia Hirsch, who is one of our physical therapists, one of our head physical therapists, who works very closely with all of our total hip, total knee, and total shoulder uh, patients and helps get them through that recovery period so they can get their function back. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vidasti, for the introduction. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I think it's fitting that I end the webinar because as I tell most of my joint replacement patients, you, by the time you get to outpatient therapy after the surgery, you are in the home stretch. Um, as Dr. Berliner spoke about in his talk, most patients opt to have this surgery because they've been dealing with pain, disability, and loss of function for several months, if not years. And by the time they have the surgery and end up in my clinic, they are in the home stretch and we tell them that you're in the home stretch. You just have to give us a couple more months and then you're good to go. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the overall recovery in the outpatient physical therapy setting. Most of the doctors here, they talked about how most patients are spending much less time in the hospital, if at all. Most patients are going straight home and most patients are ending up in outpatient therapy within a week of surgery, whether it's a unicompartmental knee, total shoulder, total knee or total hip, and regardless of the approach. Um, our general goal in outpatient physical therapy is to improve your function, get you back to your mobility goals that you had before surgery, and obviously to minimize your pain. We certainly don't want to do any harm. Okay, so a little bit about the immediate outpatient recovery. Whether it's your shoulder, your knee, or your hip, there's a universal healing process that happens across the board. And I think it's important to understand there is a little bit of pain involved, although we are definitely doing a much better job controlling patients' pain. In the acute phase, which is about the first two to four weeks after surgery, our goal in PT is to reduce your pain, reduce your swelling. We're gonna do work with your, with your uh, replaced joint to improve your motion, improve your mobility. But we really want to make sure that you're not too swollen, you're not too painful. It's normal in that acute phase to have a little bit of uh, warmth to touch and a little bit of swelling. After the acute phase, after about three to four weeks, the pain definitely starts to subside. Now we're in that repair phase, the maturation phase. At this stage, we're going to be a little bit more aggressive with our range of motion techniques, a little bit more aggressive with our exercises. We want to get you functioning. We want to get you out of the sling, off the walker, off the cane, um, and get you moving more comfortably and continually addressing any pain or, or discomfort that you might have. Um, in the acute phase, again, we just want to allow normal healing to take place. So most of our patients are walking in unassisted at this point. Sometimes after a knee or a hip, they have a cane, maybe a walker, but I am seeing that much, much less especially for patients who, who do the outpatient joint procedures. Most of them are coming in without an assistive device at all. 
shoulder replacement patients and reverse total shoulder replacement patients are coming in still with a sling for a couple of weeks. Um, again, we do start with gentle range of motion and we just want to minimize pain, reduce adhesions, reduce scarring. Most of our patients are being educated. They're doing prehab at ONSPT before the surgery. They've met with Tori. They've met with the physical therapist. They come into outpatient therapy, again, the home stretch, understanding the process and the procedures so they know what, the, what to expect. Um, and again, all of this lends to a much better experience and much less pain overall. After that first couple of weeks, when we get into the more mature phase, we're definitely using fewer modalities, although some patients are still icing up to about three months post. Uh, we start to do more weight bearing exercises for patients who have to do stairs. Um, by the first six weeks after a hip or knee replacement, we are expecting our patients to be able to go up and down stairs foot over foot, to be able to get on and off the toilet without needing to use their hands, to be able to get in and out of a car, walking in the community without assistive devices, and obviously also steadily expecting their pain to be less and swelling to be minimal. The same can be said for a shoulder replacement patient. Usually after they get out of their sling, they can start to use their shoulder for light things like brushing their teeth, maybe combing their hair. Um, they might still need a little bit of assistance getting a shirt on and off, but they can use their arm for regular uh, daily activities. Obviously no lifting and definitely no lifting overhead. Um, after about six weeks post in a shoulder replacement patient, we do start to have them move their arm a little bit more freer through their full range of motion. And then basically in all shoulder re joint replacement recovery, by three months post, we are expecting patients to have fully met their goals when it comes to function. Can I get in and out of the car? Can I lift overhead for a basic plate in the kitchen? Can I hold a coffee cup? Can I hold a water bottle? Can I go for a walk with my friends? Can I go for a walk even with Hills? By three months post, most healing has happened and now you're completely in the maturation phase where we just steadily progress your strength, your overall mobility, get you back to the activities that you want to try doing. Um, so, so from start to finish to review for outpatient physical therapy for most joints, it's about six weeks of therapy to maybe up to three months of outpatient physical therapy. There is always outliers. There are superstars who are done within four to six weeks, and then there are patients who might need to come longer. But each plan is catered to your individual needs, and I think that's important to remember. Um, a couple of questions people usually ask in the outpatient physical therapy process is what can they get back to doing? And as a general rule of thumb, I tell most of my patients, if you did it before successfully, like if you played tennis before your knee replacement, if you rode your bike, your road bike before your hip replacement, if you played paddle tennis before your shoulder replacement, then you should be able to get back to that after these joint replacement surgeries. That's at least always our goal. I don't encourage patients to start an activity after a joint replacement that they have never done before. That's just the general rule of thumb. But all of our plans of care are catered to each individual patient's needs and all of your exercises take into account your function, your goals, and what you want to get back into doing. Mostly it's exercise. You don't come to PT to rest. But at the end of the day, we really are trying to minimize your pain and improve your overall function, get you back to, to where you want to be with no pain. So at this point, I see that we've had some questions here. We've got a couple of questions, and I believe the first one was for Dr. Berliner about bilateral tonal knee replacement. So if you have any questions, feel free to, to enter them now. This is when we're going to go into those, and I'm going to pass the mic to Dr. Berliner so he can answer this first question, and we'll take your questions as they come. Thanks, Alicia. So um, just reading off of the, the question column here, I think the question was, does having bilateral total knee replacements lead to the need for hip replacements? And I think the short answer to that question is likely um, that knee replacements are unlikely to lead to the need for a hip replacement. Now, there are certainly patients that have had pre-existing hip and knee arthritis at the same time. Um, and for those patients, once they have arthritis in the hip, it will continue to progress. And they may find that despite their knee replacement, their hip pain does progress to the point where they're considering surgery. 
but taking knee replacement kind of as its own entity, if anything, the goal is to improve your gait, improve your function, and take some of the pressure off of the other joints. So I think if you don't have pre-existing hip arthritis and you have a knee replacement, that my expectation would be that the hip eventually would, would not need a, a surgery and that it would continue to function quite well. Um, Dr. Chu is no longer here, so I think the next question was for Dr. Chu, and the, the individual asked, how long after knee replacement would I be able to play golf? Will the surgery have any adverse effect on my game? And please keep in mind, I am already terrible. <laughs> I think that um, if you're lucky, you know, you might get better after the surgery, but I think that in general, as Alicia was saying, if it's an activity that you've done before the operation, if anything, our hope would be that by undergoing the joint replacement procedure, a lot of the arthritic pain that you may have had during golf or even afterwards, as a lot of patients feel like they kind of pay afterwards for an increased activity level, that that arthritic pain would be essentially resolved. And I think once you're through that recovery period and the muscles around the knee have become strong after the surgery, you should really be able to do any activity that you'd like to do um, after the operation and not expect to have any of that arthritic pain. And I think golf is certainly a reasonable expectation to be able to play. Now, in terms of how long it may take, I think it's a little bit variable, but in general, we tell patients that more vigorous activities such as sports like hiking or doubles tennis or golf is sometime around the three month time point. Um, and certainly hopefully by six months after the surgery, patients are able to get back to all those sporting type of activities. Um, the next question is how long does a hip replacement last, which is a very good question. Um, this can be a long drawn out answer, but I think that traditionally 10 or 15 years ago, the reason that hip replacements weren't lasting a terribly long time is because the, the kind of the weak link in the hip replacement was the plastic. So a hip replacement is made of four components. Um, there's a very durable plastic polyethylene liner that snaps into the titanium cup. And the original plastics that we were using lasted somewhere around 10 to 20 years. Over the last five to 10 years, we've started using much more durable polyethylene. Um, and we actually don't know exactly how long it lasts in patients because we've only been using it about five to 10 years. But if you do studies of it where it's put into a, a machine and it's cycled millions of times, it seems like these plastics should be lasting over 30 years, maybe even 40 or 50. So I think ultimately time will tell, but considering that the average age of a hip replacement is 65, I tell most of my patients that the expectation is that their hip replacement will likely outlast them and that there really isn't any concern that you'll have to go back to the operating room to revise the joint replacement because something is worn out. I think that our goal is to give you one surgery, relieve your hip pain, and not have you come back to the operating room uh, to replace any worn out parts. Um, the next question in the total knee replacement, how long uh, before the patient can walk unassisted? So I think uh, if you're talking about walking unassisted without the help of another individual, this could even potentially happen within the first day. Of course, it depends on your preoperative function and your overall independence before the surgery. I think a very good predictor of how patients will progress after the surgery is your overall strength, balance, coordination, and gait function prior to the operation. Um, but for patients that are walking around unassisted, not using a cane or a walker prior to the surgery, I think a lot of patients may have the goal that within one to two days, they're walking without the help of another individual. Now, I think using an assisted device is the norm after a hip or knee replacement. Most patients are using a walker for maybe a couple of days, maybe just one day, um, and then they transition to a cane. And I think generally within around three weeks or so, maybe plus or minus a week, most patients are able to wean off of the cane and walk completely unassisted. But I think it's important to remember that after hip or knee replacement, there's really no restrictions in terms of weight bearing or movement of the joint. And so I think whatever you know you feel comfortable or capable of doing safely, that is, it's okay to do after the operation. I mean, I think the next question is for Dr. Vidazdi on, on shoulder replacement. So I'll pass over um, the mic to her and let her finish up these questions.
Katie, I think you're still on mute. Thank you. Yep. Um, thank you, Sarah. So there are a couple questions regarding shoulder replacements. The first one asks um, the difference in need for total shoulder replacement versus reverse shoulder replacement. And that really is determined um, primarily by the function of the rotator cuff. There are other subtle details that we look at, including the bone quality. Um, that may determine or push us into doing a reverse total shoulder replacement, but most of the time that decision is based on the rotator cuff. And if the rotator cuff is not functioning, we are again unable to do a regular or standard uh, shoulder replacement and we will do a reverse shoulder replacement in that uh, situation. Um, sometimes during a shoulder replacement, the acromion, which is the bone on top, can fracture. In that case, sometimes the procedure will be converted during surgery to a reverse total shoulder replacement. So hopefully that answers uh, that question. Um, the next question asks about returning to golf and playing football um, after a uh, reverse total shoulder replacement. After reverse total or, or a tolder, uh, total, and that can vary a little bit depending on your recovery. I think people will start to do some chipping and putting after um, either one of those procedures around the three month mark, and we'll let them gradually progress from there. Throwing a football, uh, you will definitely be able to throw a football without pain after both of these procedures. Um, you will have some limitation in, what, um, in terms of the strength and power to be able to do that. So I can't say we'll get you back to a, a college um, throwing career, but certainly there is some ability to do that if you're interested in, in doing that in a more casual fashion. Um, the other question that I think comes up that is uh, important, and I'll quickly talk about um, sleep. Sleeping after a total shoulder replacement, reverse or regular, can be very challenging. I think it's one of the hardest things that we face after this surgery, probably more than pain. Um, people have a hard time sleeping in a sling. They find it very uncomfortable. So I work closely and talk with my patients. I think the most important thing is that your arm stays in front of your body. Um, and doesn't cross your body in front or behind. And so I think it's something I, I recommend patients actually practice before they have surgery is putting the sling on and finding a comfortable position. For some people that's sitting in a uh, chair, um, for other people it's sitting in bed and having pillows appropriately bumping them up. And so I think that it's something to, to practice ahead of time. And I also think core strength is important for that because if you can't sit up without the use of that arm, it's very difficult at night to be able to, to roll over or find a comfortable position. The last question that I see here is regarding cortisone injections, and I will just address that briefly in the shoulder because it is an important topic. We have a lot of patients who request a total shoulder a injection in the um, in the shoulder with arthritis rather than having a total shoulder replacement. There are benefits. It's obviously avoiding surgery. Unfortunately, in the shoulder, it does increase the risk of infection um, with a particular bug called P. acnes or C. acnes as it's been renamed. So we're very cautious if a patient is close to wanting or needing a total shoulder replacement, we will not recommend or encourage them to undergo a cortisone injection. Um, we'll generally ask them to wait at least three months after a cortisone injection before having surgery. But if they know they're somewhere close to that time period, I will tell them to wait. I know it's uncomfortable, but I don't wanna have that increased risk of infection in the shoulder with uh, the injection. I think that's all for the shoulder question. So I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Dr. Berliner for a couple of other questions. Sure, thanks Katie. Um, I think uh, just scrolling up a bit, is there a limit on the number of cortisone injections one can have in the hip? Um, I, I'm unaware of a study that gives an absolute number uh, limit to this. I think more frequently we think about it as um, the frequency or time interval uh, during which you'd have these injections. So. I think most orthopedic surgeons try to limit the number of injections uh, to the maximum being every three to four months. Um, generally, if the, the pain is recurring that quickly after the injections um, and the injections are lasting less than a month or two, we, we start to think of other treatment options. Um, there have been a few studies showing if you have these injections too frequently that it may start to compromise some of the strength of the bone in the joint and sometimes even lead to very small type of fractures in the joint. Um, so I think it's not as much uh, thinking about it over, you know, the lifetime of the patient, but more how frequently you're doing these injections. Um, a, a question to clarify total knee replacement. Um, any differences if one is having a double total knee replacement? So I think 
for many patients, uh, they do actually have arthritis in both of their knees at the same time. I think that when you're thinking about uh, knee replacement surgery in general, uh, after discussions with your surgeon, most try to talk to the patient about doing one uh, joint at a time, mainly because it's difficult for the patient to do both at the same time from a rehab standpoint. Also, the risks associated with the surgery are slightly increased when you do both at the same time. For example, it's a longer anesthetic, it's a longer procedure, it's more stress on the body, the risk of a blood transfusion goes up, the risk of blood clots goes up a little bit. Now, these are very small incremental changes. Um, I think for certain patients, namely patients who really have no pre-existing medical conditions, they're very motivated uh, to do both joints at the same time and are on board for a, a more difficult recovery the first month or two. Um, and are people that truly believe if they did one side, they may not come back to do the other. Um, and want the benefit of a more convenient recovery just one time as opposed to having to repeat it. We do sometimes discuss bilateral total knee replacement, which is doing them both at the same time, but I think that's a little bit more of a, a nuanced discussion to have with your surgeon. Um, but I think for some patients, we do actually do uh, both at the same time. Um, a question about skiing uh, in terms of the risk of dislocating a hip replacement during uh, skiing activities. I think that there have been many studies looking at the risk of dislocation after hip replacement. Now, I think it's important to realize that the risk overall, regardless of the approach, is very, very low. So it's probably around 1% to 2% of patients who will experience a hip dislocation after a hip replacement. Now, there have been a number of studies showing that the posterior approach, as compared to the anterior or the lateral, does have a higher risk of a dislocation. I think generally the numbers that you'll find is for anterior and lateral approach, the risk of a dislocation is less than 1%. And after a posterior approach hip replacement, it may be somewhere in the range of about 2%. So again, the risk, even if you've had a posterior approach, is 98% chance that you're not going to have a dislocation. Now, if you have a traumatic event like a car accident or a re really bad ski fall, I think there always is a risk of dislocating the joint. But again, I don't think the risk is high enough to discourage you from doing those type of activities. I think more importantly, it's just important to be safe and know your skill set and kind of your boundaries and not, you know, exceed that increased risk of having a bad fall or injuring uh, the joint that's been replaced. And then the last question was, how long does a knee replacement last? I did um, before talk about the longevity of a hip replacement. I think they're very similar. In both hip and knee replacements, generally, the weak link has been the plastic, um, which can wear out over time. Over the last five to 10 years, we've been using a stronger plastic called highly cross-linked highly, uh, cross polyethylene, which um, is a much more durable plastic. And um, these days we think last by over 30 years. Again, for the majority of patients who are having the surgery, they're having one operation and they're not having to worry about the plastic component in their hip or their knee wearing out. Um, and then lastly, there was a question of whether there will be a replay of this program. Um, from my understanding, and, and Cindy can correct me uh, if there's any additional details, but there will be a link on the ONS website with a replay of this webinar. Um, so certainly you can go back and revisit this and look at the slides and, and listen to our talks again. So I think um, that that summarizes the, the program tonight. Um, Cindy, if there's any anything else you want to add, feel free. But otherwise, we appreciate certainly everybody um, taking the time to listen to the webinar tonight. And of course, we're always you know more than happy to see you and you know evaluate your your joint pain and your condition and go into a lot of these specifics a lot more in detail. Um, and so we have offices in Harrison. Greenwich and Stanford, and um, usually, you know, we're able to get patients into the office within a, a couple, a day or two of, of them calling, and, and we're always happy to see them in the office.